Listen to the wondrous story counted once among the lost. Yet one came down from heaven's glory, saving us at awful cost. Who saved us from eternal loss? What did he do? Here is he now. Good his place have taken, highest of the high, though he, the loved one on the cross forsaken, was one of the God and three, who saved us from eternal loss. What did he do? Now in heaven interceding, will you surrender to the Savior, to his scepter humbly bow? You too shall come to know his favor, he will save you, save you now. Who saved us from eternal loss? What did he do? Where is he now? In heaven interceding. Be seated. Good morning. It's great to see everyone here today, members and visitors and members that I haven't met. Uh, for anyone joining us online, welcome. Hopefully everyone was able to uh, bring your program, I guess, online today, or uh, maybe I think there were a few in the back. Uh, if not, uh, uh, you should be able to find one online. The uh, If you're a visitor, there should be cards in the back of the seat in front of you for you to fill out and uh, you can leave them on the seat or put them in the tray when the tray comes around. This week, uh, as we start to worship together, I wanted to provide a scripture for uh, to help us prepare. I'm going to read from Psalm 100 and it's a psalm for giving thanks. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Finally, as we prepare for today's service, I ask that you clear your mind, open your heart, and lift your voice to God with joyful song. Take Joe's message today and apply it to your life. And leave today charged to unite God's kingdoms through your actions, your words, and your kindness to others.
morning everybody get ready for the rain it's coming I'll be reading from Deuteronomy 31 verses 1 and 5 through 8 so then Moses went out and spoke the words to all Israel the Lord will deliver them to you and you must do to them all that I have commanded you be strong and courageous do not be afraid or terrified because of them for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with his people into the land that the Lord swore to their forefathers to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. As the deer grants for the water, so my soul wants rather you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Yeah. 
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dearest Father, we are so thankful that you have provided us with the avenue of prayer. Here on this world, it would be so presumptuous for us that we would be able to say call the governor or call the president, just feel like we can pick up the phone, talk to them anytime we want. But you, the great creator, the maker of all that we know, unbounded by time or space, with prayer, we have the opportunity to have that direct line to you, to speak to you, and we know that you listen and respond. And we're so thankful for that. We thank you for helping us by sending Jesus who came on this earth and He led a perfect example, showed us how we should live and even more important than that, we're so weak and, and we're so sinful and He was willing to take upon Himself the punishment for all of our sins. We thank You that since He has done that, that You've also sent to us Your Holy Spirit to help and guide us and direct us through our faulty lives to better know how to have You in our heart and to follow Your ways. We come to You now concerned about so many problems. There are evil men who are forcing their own desires upon others through wars. We pray that You would thwart their evil intentions and bring them into humility and allow those who are righteous to prevail. We especially think about our Ukrainian brothers and sisters who are suffering so much now from the evil that's upon them. And we're thankful for those that have found safety and we pray that they might one day be able to return to their home in peace and safety. We also have national concerns. We're privileged to be in a country where we have a voice in deciding who is to be, who are, our rulers are to be. And we pray that you would lead us to make right decisions there and just as importantly, lead those men who are elected to know your ways and follow them and be true to what they've promised to do. We have many who are suffering in this congregation, various kinds of suffering. There are those who have lost loved ones, those who continue to be plagued by physical illnesses, and then those that are just losing their spiritual drive and their, their ability to follow You. We pray for all of these and know that Your hand can intervene and make good changes, and we ask that You would do so. We also pray for each of us. We know that we often fall short. We're in continuous need for forgiveness, and we pray that You would help us to be less that way and to be more perfect and let your light shine in us towards other people so they would see the difference that you make in our life. Help us to respond to people that may notice this by being able to have ready recollection of those things in the Scripture and those things that you have taught us that will help those doubters and unbelievers learn about the one true and the only God. Help us to be your agents in letting them see you. We pray that you would be with us through this service. We've set aside this time to come together with all of our fellow Christians in this area to give you honor, to give you praise, and to learn from your word. And we pray that you would bless this assembly together. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sweat and blood, the strength. 
this song that we just sang reminds us of the loneliness, the anxiety that uh, our Lord was experiencing in that garden. Sure, He had others with Him, but He was there by Himself at the same time. When Christ the man of sorrows in tears, sweat, and blood, He for our transgressions had to weep alone. No friend with words to comfort, nor hand to help was there. Let this cup of anguish pass from me, I pray. Yet, if it must be suffered by me, thine only Son, let thy will be done. There's another song that we sing frequently that continues that time in the garden. And uh, I would like to for us to think about that as we go forward. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the street in shame. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, Crucify him, he's to blame. Upon his precious head they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the king. They struck him, they cursed him, they mocked his holy name. And all alone he suffered everything. Yes, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world, and to set him free, but he died alone for you and me. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come to thee this morning thanking thee for this true opportunity that we have to gather around the communion table with thee and, and honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that was so willing to go through this torture and this pain and suffering that he went through for each one of us. For he knew without that we would be lost, and he was willing to do that for us. We thank thee, Father. We thank our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee for this bread which represents his body nailed to that cross, for the anguish he suffered for each one of us. And Father, help us to take all other things out of our mind at this point and reflect and focus on what great a blessing that truly is for each one of us. And Father, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. Yeah. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we come to Thee again thanking You for 
life itself, for most of all for eternal life with you one day in heaven. And Father, we're thankful for this fruit of the vine that represents Christ's blood shed for each one of us that we may have that hope for a home with thee in heaven one day. We thank you, Father, for that, and we pray for that home. Please be with us as we partake now, and again, forgive us of our sins in Christ's name. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come to Thee at this time thanking You for all the many blessings You've so richly blessed us with, both spiritually and physically. We're thankful for Your congregation, Your church that meets at this location, and not only here but around the world. And we pray, Father, that uh, Your message will be spread throughout this world through uh, each person's helping with uh, funds to help spread the word. We realize it is yours to begin with, and we pray that it will be used in a manner that would be pleasing unto thee and, and will continue to, to flourish that word throughout the world. Be with us now and forgive us in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat>
kind of for five power. Most problems, they don't all well probably not yet to be we stand together and sing a mighty fortress in our God. <laughs> Somehow my slide presentation disappeared. So, um, <laughs> Technology, you can't live with it, you can't live without it, right? Uh, we want to welcome each and every one of you this morning. I'll tell you that as they get started and uh, pulled up. No, it's there uh, because I brought the disc, thankfully, uh, to put it on there. Uh, just in case something like this happened. Um, I don't know why I had a feeling it might, but uh, sure enough. Um, we welcome our members and visitors alike. Uh, I want to tell you, as great a day as we can have today, and I hope you're having a great experience of being with God and God's people in worship this morning, uh, Sunday, next Sunday, is a great day we have planned uh, for our church family. Um, 
It is our, what I'm calling Zambia Emphasis Day, um, where we have uh, David Linda Gregerson, who were there for five years on the ground in Zambia at Namwianga Mission, working, uh, evangelizing, uh, sharing the story with people in the States uh, who supported them of what was going on at Namwianga. They're going to come back and be with us Sunday uh, and kind of bring us back up to speed because there are a lot of folks here, in fact, who don't know anything about Namwianga. We have a lot of newer folks who weren't here when they were experiencing that uh, during those five years. That's been a spell uh, since they were there. Uh, and uh, in the interim, David preached for a church in Missouri for several years and is now retired uh, from full-time ministry, but able to do stuff like this. And so they're going to be here. Uh, we're also going to have our special contribution, remember, for the Zambia Baby Milk Fund, we call it. So please be prayerful about that. And if that were not enough, it's lunch day. Okay. Remember, it's fifth Sunday lunch day. So uh, come prepared for that to share food uh, with everyone as well. So uh, that's what's coming up uh, this next Sunday. Um, the stuff has been changed around a little bit to accommodate uh, uh, voting uh, that's happening this week and next week. Um, we finally have, there you go. All right. We have, we have action. Appreciate that, guys. Um, I will. I will start to say this. Normally, uh, for a number of years, I had this going. And when we get to the season of spooks and ghosts and goblins, things that go bump in the night, my practice was uh, to address the issue of fear. Uh, and of course, the the best Sunday to do that on is in our calendar this year, October thirtieth. But we're busy that day. I just detail that uh, for everybody. So I'm moving it to this Sunday uh, instead of doing it on on uh, missing it and doing it after and all that. So I'm I'm doing it a little bit early. Um, I thought this opening statement. And I'll make it a little larger here. I thought this opening statement by Seneca was very uh, very good, alluding to a number of different stats figures. Quotes I could to which I could point you, and I've I've actually done some of that in the past to reassure us that many of the things we fear, that we get anxious, that we worry, get tied up about, number one, never come to pass. Many of those things don't, and secondly, they're not legitimate causes for fear or concern in the first place. Um, I also really like the metaphor about fear shared with me recently by. Uh, a Scott Swaim and the Gospel Coalition from a couple of years ago. And I want to use this metaphor with the biblical story uh, and, and text this morning. I think it's a useful analogy. He says that people are often, uh, so often speaking uh, against Christians having so many fears. And we hear, and, and we've given these to each other, haven't we, as Christians, saying that we should fear not. We shouldn't be so anxious in Christ. Uh, we have the awesome power of God on, on our side. You know, it's it just it's just a sign of a lack of faith if you're fearful. That's what we tell folks. Uh, <clears throat> and really, that's the wrong approach to take to it because that's looking and acting as if the heart. And, and I love his illustration here that the heart is like a is like a cup, and saying that we can we can just. We should just empty that cup and pour out everything that's uh, inappropriate for the life of one who is faithful as a Christian who should not have any fear. And what do we do when we when we use that kind of analogy? We forget that there are still in the life even of a Christian, of a faithful Christian, there's still legitimate reasons for having some fears, having some anxiety. Uh, at times. Some of those are healthy kinds of things. Not to mention the fact that it's just not within our power as human beings to set aside every kind of fear that comes to us in this world. It's just not humanly possible. Um, so it doesn't matter how much I 
or any other speaker up here in this forum tells you, hey, folks, if you're faithful, you need to not be afraid about anything. It doesn't matter how much anyone would say that, it's just not going to happen completely, right? Uh, that's just human experience. Uh, some of it's going to be there. But his point is that rather than seeing the heart as a, as a cup where all the negative can just be dumped out and replaced with something better, it's more like this picture. It's more like a scale. Uh, the kind used to symbolize justice, uh, as you recall, for its two sides way out fears and biblical, uh, with biblical encouragement and exhortations uh, to courage uh, that way. It sounds something like this. If a person's heart is heavy with sorrow due to loss of some good thing or things or overwhelmed with pressures and anxieties of the world, present uncertainties or future uncertainties, whatever it might be, that the counterweight is involved. Not removing all those negative emotions and things, but rather placing them in relationship to something much larger, much larger reality, and that is a reminder of God's presence, His sovereign goodness, His attention, His purpose, which offer solid reasons for encouragement and hope in the midst of trials and fears and anxieties. You see, the counterweights, they don't remove the other weights on our hearts, but rather they enable our hearts to bear the weight of sorrow, anxiety, fear, whatever it might be, in this existence until, until such day when we make it into His presence when all will be completely goodness and light in the face of God. So I like that metaphor. And I like how it plays out in our Scripture today what should be a very familiar story to all of us. And it opens in Joshua 1 where Joshua... Servant of the Lord, formerly Moses' right hand, right hand man rather, has just lately become commander of all the forces of Israel. He's had that mantle of, that heavy mantle, I'm sure it was very heavy, uh, of leadership placed upon him now that Moses is gone. The people are poised on the very edge of the moment when they'll start the conquest of Canaan, something they should have done 40 years earlier. Uh, and, and they'll really start possess the land promised to them years before by God. So imagine the anticipation that's been building for 40 years from the time when the entrance should have happened in the first place. The new Israel, as we'll call them, are very stoked because they've heard of things going on. Things from the people of Cana that indicate that people are melting in fear because of their advancement. Now, not because of them not because of anything Israel's doing, but because of Israel's God, right? Because of the God of Israel, the one true living God. Listen to the words of Rahab to the two spies who promised her that she and her family would be spared destruction for her part in giving them shelter. This is Joshua 2.11. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. What a confidence builder this had to have been for uh, these Israelites. This thing, this thing is actually going to happen. It's like it's a done deal this time. Well, they've been there before, right? So there's cause for some concern, as we'll see in just a moment. But the two spies are so excited that the moment the coast is clear and the search for them is over, they hightail it back to uh, the Israelite camp and they share their news with their new leader. In verse 24, same chapter, uh, we hear this. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. Indeed, all the inhabitants of the land melt in terror before us. It just turned to liquid because of what they've seen and heard about our God. Don't you think all of this collectively would be enough to give Joshua as commander-in-chief the ability to say, Hallelujah! 
This is it. It's really going to happen this time. You would think so. And maybe it totally did. You know, Maybe he totally made that kind of statement and had that kind of thinking going on inside. But I also strongly suspect that at least some place inside of Joshua, he was wound up tighter than the strings on a tennis racket. That his butterflies were not flying in formation. That at least part of Joshua was scared to death. Why? You ask, all this evidence is predominantly saying that they have this. Why would he have any cause for fear? He's heard about how the enemy feels. He knows that God has brought him through the Jordan on dry ground to recreate intentionally what he did with Moses in the earlier generation. Of course, Joshua was there for that one too, by the way. To bring them through on dry land at the Red Sea and to defeat Pharaoh and his army. After all that, why would Joshua have any cause for fear? Because he's human. That's why. Remember, the heart is not like a cup that you can just totally drain out all that seems inappropriate and wrong in the face of faith and have zero fears left. It's not normal. And besides, knowing his people, as Joshua did, there's no way he could not help feeling at least a little bit of deja vu all over again. Right? Y'all must not know who Yogi Berra is. That's one of my favorite yogiisms. Deja vu all over again. Right? They're, they're, he's got to have a little bit of that being mindful of what happened 40 years earlier. How well did it begin? Parting the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army defeated. Given food and water all those years in the wilderness. Clothes that never wore out. That's kind of a small detail as they gave it, but that's a pretty big deal. It's not one like Walmart was nearby where they could replace their wardrobe. Think about it. Besides all of that, God defeated all their enemies on the east side of the Jordan. So why, what rationale is there to think He's not going to do so on the west side of the Jordan? You know, it's all going smoothly for them until Numbers 13 happens. You remember the story, you remember Numbers 13. It was all downhill from there. That was when Moses sent out, you remember the twelve spies of which Joshua and Caleb were two. And you remember what the ten did, how they spoiled it for everybody else. They came back and gave what the Scripture says is an evil report, was an evil report about the land. They're giants there. We can't take it. We're like grasshoppers in comparison to those people. And you remember what God did as a result. You know, you're you're concerned about perishing. You're concerned maybe more than that about your children perishing if you go on with this journey, then you know, you're going to get your wish. You're not going to make it. your kids, ironically, are going to make it, but you're not. You're going to end here. This is the end of the road for you. So bring it, you know, fast forward 40 years. So here's a whole new set of fear inducing scenarios for Joshua to work through. What if it happens again? What if the people balk against all evidence of God working again? Can, can there be a third chance if they blow it the second time? Too much projection? I don't know, maybe. Maybe I'm projecting too much on Joshua, but. It's got to be reasonable that he had a little bit of this going on inside. What should God do? What would God do? In His infinite wisdom, God knew Joshua, and by extension, the people needed to know two key things in the face of any lingering fears that they had at this point. They needed some counterweights to build faith and balance out their fears. And the first one shows up in Joshua 5, 
verses 13 through 15. I think this is several different translations, but I want to look at these in the slide. Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho, they lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversary? And he said, No, but I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Those words are, I like that translation. Now I have come. I'm here in your presence. And Joshua rightfully fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. The first thing God gave Joshua in the face of all his real or potential fears, whatever level they might have been, was to guarantee His presence. Wouldn't this have been a great start to balance out any fears that he had that he was not alone? That Joshua, and he had to have been reminded by the way, and that picture reminds us, had to be reminded of the story that Moses would have told his people about his first encounter with God at the burning bush in the wilderness of Midian when he was told, take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. He was in the very presence of God. It was at that encounter Moses was told God's real name, I am. Meaning he always was, always is, always is to come. He is always present and always present tense, by the way. There is never a time when He has not been nor will continue to be present and near to His people. Moses needed to hear that for his mission. Joshua now needed to hear that same thing for his mission. At this critical juncture, God says, you're not doing this alone. The second thing God knew Joshua needed to hear is the thing He starts to tell him in chapter 6, beginning in verse 2. Another translation says, See, I've delivered uh, Jericho into your hand. Now, how do you correctly read that verse? You see, for people of faith, we have to make sure we get the emphasis on the correct syllable. Right? Okay, that's an old one too that some of you might miss. Here's how you properly read that sentence. See, I have given Jericho into your hand. You see how it makes a difference? Where you put the emphasis in that word from God? Was Joshua responsible for it? No. Did he have to come up with some kind of strategy or a battle plan? No. Would it be the combined decibels of sound of all the Israelites marching and blowing their trumpets on the last day that would bring down the walls of Jericho with their united shout. No! God's miraculous almighty power is what would win the day. And what did win the day? The battle belongs to the Lord. We're going to sing that song in just a few moments. The victory is always His. And this surely helped balance out the stress and the burden of fear felt by this one who'd just been given this awesome responsibility of leading this group of people. Some million odd number of people. What about us today? What are what are some of our more genuine reasons for fears or anxieties or concerns? It's probably easier it's probably easier to make a list of what's not some fear or anxiety, right? That would probably be a lot easier today. There's something coming up that about which a lot of people, Christians and non-Christians, are anxious. Right? Going on right next door. 
starting tomorrow. There's a lot of stress involved. There's a lot of angst involved. There's a lot of hostility involved. I'm going to talk about that in two weeks from today. People are also concerned about the economy, which is part with that. Will, will we have enough to live with? Will we have enough retirement? Will there be retirement? People my age wonder that. When I've read stuff about Social Security, my retirement plan, possibly being insolvent by the time I'm able to draw from that, age-wise. Will our kids have enough? Even if we do okay, what about the next generation? These are all, to some extent, legitimate concerns, legitimate reasons for anxiety in our world. Will there be a planet left here when they're older? We, we also fear natural calamities that we know are all around us and ever-present in our world of all kinds, as well as all types of things that can go wrong with our physical health. And I haven't even gotten to the point of all the social, psychological, spiritual causes for fear. Will our lives have meaning beyond the end of this life? Many fear the unknown future beyond death, while many others fear they're not prepared for eternity. Confidence dims, it seems, in late life as to whether one's done enough or said enough or been enough to be pleasing to God. What do we do in a world full of all kinds of fear, some of which are legitimate, some measure of it in our day-to-day -day world is just healthy, for example, fear of security. I'll just give you one. Makes you aware of your surroundings, right? Makes you lock up things that need to be secured. Makes you know what you're doing, especially in a place at, at night you're not familiar with. Fear for your safety while driving makes you, I hope, more in the moment and alert. And not on a device or something else. And I'm talking to myself there as much as anybody else. All these kinds of things can have their place, and yet we as God's people today are called to live above the measure of fear with which the world is consumed because we have some things to balance those out. Number one is that God's presence will always be with us. It sound familiar? God's presence will always be with us, always be within us. And with you always, Jesus said as he left his disciples on this earth to carry out his mission, even to the end of the age. And secondly, it's by God's mighty power and strength that the victory is assured. The battle belongs to the Lord. Does that sound familiar? It should. The same two answers to people's fears and concerns in Israel's day are the same two answers for those of us in Christ that we need to hear and be assured of today. The very same. Hasn't changed. Notice just a few settings where these two assurances are made very clear to the Christian and then we'll be done. Just prior to his death, Jesus knew the one thing his fearful, uncertain disciples urgently needed to know, just as their mission was about to begin in earnest. It was the fact that he would continue to always be with them, only now in a different way. Notice in John 14, I'll pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth. I will not leave you comfortless. Some translations say, I'll not leave you orphaned or abandoned. I will come to you. And in fact, those words speak in a nutshell the really the content of much of John 14-16 through 16, where Jesus promises to leave them with His presence in a different way, but nevertheless His presence with them once He was no longer physically here. 
And then a little bit more about this in 14, 25 and following. These things I've spoken to you while I'm with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Peace I lay with you. My peace I give to you, not like the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled. I love that last line in our context today. Nor let it be, say that last word with me, fearful. Don't let it be troubled. Do not let it be fearful. We as Christians can live faithfully in fearful times because His presence shall be ours till the end of this life and beyond. John later would say the one in you is greater than the one who's in the world. That was his first letter. Uh, 1 John 4, verse 4. Back in the Gospel, however, Jesus, knowing our strength and resolve, would sometimes waver in the face of fears and struggles, reemphasized with this word. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And I, I really like how that version says it. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, do you hear that second assurance? We already heard the first one. But you hear the second assurance in those words? Jesus, in Jesus, the victory is already won. We'll overcome in the end because He already has overcome. And Paul reaffirms that uh, by virtue of the power of Jesus' resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is in the law, but thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, therefore meaning because of all that I've just said about us having the victory, therefore, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We're in a situation much like Joshua and the new Israel of his day when you think about it. We're poised on the edge of our promised land. But because there's potential for fear and anxiety and stress all around us that could hold us back, there are these two things we need to know before we can possess our possession. We're not in it alone. And we don't have to fight a battle that God's already won. Amen? We just need to live like that. Like we're convicted that He's already won. And rejoice in His victory. Are we there yet? Can we say that yes, we're excited to face the future and we can face the future whatever happens in our physical circumstances, we can still face it with confidence because we know the battle belongs to the Lord. We know that victory is already given to us. He's placed it in our hands. Let's live like it and testify not just through our words that we say and hear, but through the way we live Monday through Saturday the truth of what we know to be right. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let's sing about that as we stand here. In heaven the armor is in the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory,
Thank you for that lesson, Joe. I uh, hope we all will remember that the battle does belong to the Lord. I appreciated Keith's prayer so much this morning uh, when he mentioned Ukraine. Uh, I want everyone here to know that uh, Bonnie and Jerry Schmidt just returned uh, from visiting our missionaries in Mexico, and we do plan to give you a report from that trip as quickly as we can. Uh, we've got some things that are going to take precedence over that for a few weeks, uh, starting next week with a report from Nam Wianga. Uh, we ask you to continue to pray for that work and all of our works as we attempt to strengthen our missionaries and, and every other work that we're involved in. Remember that we here are blessed among all people and that we need to strengthen Christians around the world as much as we can. Thank you for doing that and being conscientious in that practice. Thank you. Spending men's hearts with fear, freedom we all hold dear. Now is that day? Hey, Humble your heart to God, and the day sing one. Take the way, sing the way, run, strut, Christians away.